Greetings, everyone, in the mighty and wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanking God for you all. Um, I was saying earlier today that there are those whose faces are not seen on the screen, and there are those we haven't seen for a while. But we are mindful. All of us are mindful of all our brethren the, and, and visitors that we haven't seen, those who visited our churches. Thank God for everyone. I mentioned that um, in Romans 13, Paul the Apostle made mention um, of faces and names that we hadn't heard of in the written Gospels or in his written letters. But at the end, rather like, <clears throat> rather like film credits, he mentioned your names and he asked to greet this one and greet that one. And he mentioned what their services were to the body of Christ. So thank you all for being present this, this evening. Our Sunday school lesson is, is entitled, In Remembrance of Me. In Remembrance of Me. How many of us like, would like to be remembered? It's, in, it's human nature, isn't it? It's human nature. All of us, we don't want to be forgotten about. It doesn't matter who we are. We want somebody to remember us. And that is why we live so that we might touch lives. We might make an impression. We might impact somebody's life. Okay, the topic is in remembrance of me. And the lesson is drawn from St. Mark chapter 14, reading from verse 17 to 26. Um, for those who, are, who, are, who, are, who, might, who might be listening in without, without a Bible, um, I'm going to ask somebody to just, Sister Kay, can you, um, can you just quickly read the verses that are, that are um, presented to us from St. Mark chapter 14, verse 17 to 26, and also 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. I just want everybody to be fully conscious of what is being talked about, okay? Okay. Please go ahead. Mark chapter 14. From verse yeah. 17 to 26, and I shall read. That's it. <clears throat> and in the evening he cometh with the twelve, mm -hmm. and as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto one of you, unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful, and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had <clears throat> never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave to them. And they said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it in new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Amen. The second scripture is 1 Corinthians 11, from verse Amen. 23 to 26. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> Our lesson is broken down into four main headings, with some headings. Part one, as you can see in your books. Part one is about preparation for the Passover. 
um, part two, Jesus with the 12, um, part three, the Lord's Supper instituted, and part four, this do in remembrance of me. And this is the thrust of our lesson today, remembering the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Okay. Um, the subheading for part one talks about a man with a pitcher of water and what took place in the upper room. Part two is about Jesus being betrayed. The, the betrayer is talked about. Um, they ask the question, is it I? Um, the bread being broken, the cup being drunk. And um, practice of communion, remember on purpose. Now, the culture connection, which I won't bother to read, it basically talked about what took place on September 11th, okay, 9-11, when the American towers came down because of the, you know, the damage caused by the terrorists and so on. So it's really highlighting the fact that there were those who lost their lives, people who hazarded their lives, and remembrance was made of them. It also talked about Jesus and the, Lord, the, the Last Supper and how we observe the Lord's Supper, which is sometimes called the, the Last Supper, and also the, the other faiths call it the, the Eucharist and so on. And it is the fact that it is a sober celebration for the blood that was shed for you and for me. Okay? But I'm not going to dwell too much on, the, on what is on the exposition what somebody else has written. I just really want to stick to the word of God and to just talk to you tonight about what is conveyed to us. It really deals with sacrifice. Who can tell me about certain groups that make sacrifice? I'll come to the fullness of it in a moment, but just give me an idea of how do you understand sacrifice? Can you think of anyone who makes sacrifices? Please unmute, say your name, and then give your comment, please. Anyone? Soldier, oh. Sister, Sister Andrea, soldiers. Soldiers, that's a very good one, Sister Andrea. Anyone else? Anyone else? I will call you by name. Sister Noti from Britain. Yeah, go ahead. Parents make sacrifices for their children. Wonderful. Wonderful. That is so close to home, isn't it? Parents make sacrifices for their children constantly. You have to every day. Can you think of any, any other groups? Sister pastors. Soldiers. This is Barbara. Pastors. Pastors. Okay. Yes, that's right. The pastor's life is a sacrificial life. There's no doubt about it. In fact, all, the believer's life is a sacrificial life, but especially those who lead. Those who are constantly before God, they give up their lives because that's what their calling is about. No man can serve two masters, okay? But in the same line as what Sister Andrea said, can you think of anyone else? She mentioned soldiers. What about Sister the Rose? Pardon? Sister Rose. Sister Rose, go ahead. Um, um, We have groups that do human sacrifice, animal sacrifice. Um, okay, I wasn't really thinking along those lines um, about those who actually carry out rituals. I'm not talking about rituals, we're talking about in, in the context of how Christ was our sacrifice. Okay, um, I would say that the nurses, the doctors. Nurses, excellent one, especially at this time. We have to bear in mind those yeah. NHS workers, those who are on the front line who hazarded their lives every day so that the public can be safe, okay, or can recover from their illness. So they risk their lives. I'm really talking about those who are called upon to make, as it were, the ultimate sacrifice, okay? So we've got the NHS, we've got the soldiers, anyone else in that way? The police I mentioned before? Yeah. Yeah. Sister Vivette, Sister Vivette, go ahead. Personal bodyguards, for example, um, people who protect the presidents and the royal family, such like. That, that, that is true. That is true. Um, 
that's semi-voluntary and involuntary. But people like the police, are, you know, that's what the job entails. They have to risk their lives every day. The firemen, to so save time, the fire, the fire services, those guys and women who run into burning buildings, they have to rescue people. <clears throat> Soldiers especially who are called upon to make the ultimate sacrifice. But I like the fact that somebody mentioned parents because parents sacrifice on behalf of their children. Now, the, the lesson is about in remembrance of, us, of me. Jesus, St. John chapter 3, verse 16 tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In other words, he above all else was called upon to make the ultimate sacrifice. He said, he said to this end was I born and for this cause came I into the world. So when we talk about remembrance, yeah, the soldiers we see are remembered every year by the queen and pageantry and the queen and other dignitaries laying wreaths at cenotaphs and so on, to remember them, to honor their memory because they, they gave their lives for us or for their countries. But Jesus above all else came into the world to give his life as a sacrifice, okay? And we're not kindergarten children, we're not little children in Sunday school. We know this, we understand this. That's why we are saved because we accepted the Lord Jesus and the sacrifice that he gave on our behalf. But as we look at our lesson today, as I said before, it's in four sections. And part A of section one, part, part one is about preparation for the Passover. In the text, it said that Jesus sent, in the earlier verses that we didn't read, the disciples came to Jesus in run about verse 13, I think, 12, 13, and said to him, where would you that we prepare the Passover? Okay, and he sent them out. Can anyone remember what he said? Can anybody remember what he said to them? He said, Sister Andrea, I desire to have um, the supper with them. Yes, that is true. But leading on from the question that they asked him in verse 12, verse 13 said, and he sendeth them forth of his, two, of his disciples, two of his disciples, and said to them, go ye into the city, and there shall you meet a man bearing a pitcher of water, follow him. Why might this be a strange thing? It was their indication that they are on the right track. But why might this be a strange thing? In relate, you know, I'm talking about the man bearing a pitcher of water. Sister Child there, because, hello? Hello, Sister go ahead. Child, because it was unusual for a man to be carrying water. Thank you. In St. John chapter 4, Jesus met the woman at the well. Yeah, she had come to draw water. It was understood that in that culture, and this might sound really sexist, but a lot of those domestic chores were classified as women's work, okay? Thank God we have moved on, hey, hey, Sister Trout. We have moved on to the 21st century where we share the chores, yeah? And I'd like to think that the brothers are not just lying back, reclining on the sofa, you know, with a remote in their hands while the sisters are working. But all of us, time has moved on, but it was a strange thing. It was an, an unusual thing for a man to be carrying a picture of water. So they went, and they found this man, and Jesus said to them, they should, and wheresoever he shall go, say to the good man of the house, the house that you see him going to, say to the good man of the house, the master said, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Verse 15, and he shall show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared there, make ready for us. So Jesus had organized this beforehand, obviously. And the disciples located this individual. They followed him and they asked the questions. So our lesson begins in earnest that in verse 17, and in the evening he cometh with the twelve. Now somebody tell me something a little bit about Passover. How do you understand 
What do you understand about Passover from your years of reading the scriptures? Anybody? Sister Chai here. Yes, Sister Chai. Yeah, it's to do with um, in Egypt. Yeah. When um, the eight, the, the eight, they had to kill an animal and put the blood on their on their on their lentil, so that you know when the death angel come, he would pass over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Was it the case though that they just grab hold of an animal? No. No, it was a. It would be a lamb. To, I mean, I would think it, it's a lamb to, to um, because the, the the Old Testament was a shadow of things to come. So I think it was a lamb to represent Christ. Yeah, but what was special about it? <clears throat> special about it would be, it was without. What was it? Yeah, you know it. You know without, it. Ahead. Without any blemish, it was. That's it. That's it. You don't have to go any further. It was a lamb without blemish. Okay? It had to be spotless. Mm -hmm. Because this was pointing to the Son of God who would come into the world to be our sacrificial lamb. Okay? Do you agree with that, everybody? Yes, sir. Okay. Amen. Yeah. So this foreshadowed... And Minister K, jump in any time because you're, you're a minister and I know that you know this, <clears throat> okay? When I do Sunday school, I don't just want to just talk at you. I want to have interaction and share the lesson so that anybody who doesn't understand anything that the lesson is trying to portray, okay, we can have clarity. I might not have all the answers. In fact, I doubt I will have all the answers, but I want to just encourage you to participate. So it had to be a lamb without blemish, okay? And they would put... Because Israel was getting ready to leave Egypt, they had to put, kill it and put the blood upon the lintel post of, their, of the door of their houses so that the death angel that would pass through Egypt would pass over them. And because they'd been leaving in a hurry, okay, then the meal that they were going to have was significant. So this Passover was instituted as a memorial Okay, you'll find this in Exodus chapter 12, I think. We won't go into that now because we have a limited time. But the Passover was instituted and Israel had kept it all their lives until this time when Jesus would eat the Passover with his disciples. But it was really about him. And so that is why there was two suppers. There was one which was the Passover supper, which was a memorial of the lamb that was slain. But Christ instituted a new supper, okay, which, is the, which would be the New Testament in his blood. Because the lamb that was slain before was inferior. And all the animals that were slain before could not take away our guilt. It could not obliterate our sins. It merely covered it so that when God looked at man, okay, God saw that something had died. It appeased him on a temporary basis, but it was insufficient. Why would you think that the lamb, an actual animal, would be insufficient to pay the penalty for our sins? Sister Andrea. Sister Andrea? Uh, because you'll have to continue to kill that animal year after year, month after month, but year after year, as it was tradition. That's and right. You it have would, to... would not continue. It could not continue. Okay. Yes, you had you had to continue to kill the lamb, to to put as it were a sticking plaster over a wound. Okay, but the wound that mankind had needed to be healed. Okay. And only one blood could bring about that healing because the animal does not equal human. The animal is a subspecies. So there's no way an animal could answer adequately for a human being. Okay? In fact, not even another human being like ourselves who were born in sin and shaped in iniquity could answer for us. So like, for instance, your most the, the, your, your young, innocent baby could not be sacrificed for you. Okay, that sounds really gross. But I'm saying that even your child 
who was innocent could not be sacrificed on your behalf. It had to be somebody like Christ who was sinless. Okay, so as we go through the lesson, <clears throat> it says, and they sat at meat. Meat is an old English word for food, as they sat at dinner or supper. Jesus said, verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. So first we had the, the man bearing the picture of water and the significance of that. And then we have the, the large upper room which was, which was prepared. Upper room just, me, just means a place, like a, a guest chamber, okay? Upstairs, an upper room, okay? Where, you know, like when we're having weddings, <clears throat> we have a large room where the guests, you know, whether we're having a birthday celebration or whatever, any kind of celebration, you normally have a large room. Well, in this context, Jesus had an upper room for him and his disciples alone. This was an intimate occasion because he was about to leave them. At this gathering, he spoke of one who would betray him. And this is one of the strangest things. You cannot imagine somebody to act or to behave like Judas, having walked with Jesus for something like three and a half years, and seeing all that he saw, and yet, for all that, he turned his back on it and betrayed the Lord. Jesus said that one of you shall betray me. And another said, is it I? They were asking among themselves, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said unto them, it is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. It tells us something about the Lord. Judas was very careful, yeah, because as yet he hadn't revealed himself. He hadn't shown his hand. But Jesus knew, Jesus knew who, that one would betray him, and he also knew who it was. And that should tell us something. What does that say to you as an individual? about your relationship with God? What does that say to you? It doesn't have to be exactly what I want. Just give me an expression of what does that say to you about you and Jesus? Sister Catherine, um, Sister we, Catherine. Can, we can at times be extremely fickle. We can at times be fickle, yes. But can you broaden that a little bit for me? <clears throat> um. When the going gets tough, <laughs> um, um, when the trials come or fear um, overtakes, suddenly uh, the identity of being a, a child of God yeah. okay. momentarily, yeah. we, we forget who we are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to add anything to that? God bless you for that. Um, Minister Kay, I would, I would say that it goes to show how much Jesus really knows what's in our heart. Amen. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. Judas was a part of the 12. Mm -hmm. He was a disciple. He wasn't known as a betrayer. He was a disciple. Mm -hmm. But yet, Jesus knew each and every one of them and knew that even though he carried the label of a disciple, Mm -hmm. But in his heart, he was a betrayer. And so for our relationship, God really knows our heart. And we can't therefore hide from him, you know, who we really are and the areas that need work. That's, that's what it says to me anyway. Thank you very much, Sister Kay. Anybody else want to say anything before I move on? Um, Pastor DJ? Sister Trout, yeah, Brother Billy. Go ahead, Sister Trump. Yeah, can I say also that the psalmist also wrote about him mm -hmm. beforehand. That's and, right. Uh, um, and I mean, as, as, as I was going to say, just as Sister Kay said that, because um, God knows your heart. And, you know, and I mean, he was really picked for that purpose, I would say. 
he was picked. <laughs> you mean he was yeah, chosen for that? Yeah, period. because I mean it was written that he, you know, in in the Psalms before, it was predicted before that it would happen. I'm glad you said that, Sister Trout. I'm <laughs> glad you said that because is that really right that he was chosen for that? I would say so. Does yes. God lay hands on somebody and says, you will be this against your will? No, it's not against his will. It was not against his will. God knew, his, mean, God knew that before he was formed in the womb that he would yeah. be a man with a hard heart and a person and he was okay. trying to fulfill, his, to fulfill God's purpose. Okay. Pastor Trump, um, um, Overseer Diedrich, on mute. Overseer Diedrich, can you hear me? Can you unmute yourself and yeah. hear? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I think the answers are all good. Um, you know, I don't even know if Judas really knew his own self, but obviously his character, you know, uh, was molded over time. Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of desires in his heart was there. Mm -hmm. So although he was uh, among the 12 disciples, you know, the, uh, yes, maybe he was a bit of a, a loner at times. <clears throat> and the desire and love uh, for the money, you may have led him to, 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 to become the betrayer. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much for that. The small point I was making of Sister Trout's answer was that, yes, there, there had to be a, a traitor. There had to be a son of perdition. But God didn't look at Judas and say, among all the 12, I want you to be the traitor. No. Judas, like all of us, had a choice. And he made that choice. Okay? Jesus knew that he was the betrayer. But I want you to see something about Jesus. Jesus did not treat Judas any differently than how he treated the other 11. Okay? That's the character of Jesus. So when he turns around and tells us that we must love our enemies and do good to those who mistreat us, paraphrasing, yeah? Then he was speaking from a platform of love. Yeah, he hasn't told us to do anything that he hasn't done himself. But it also points out, as Sister Kay said, that God knows everything that is going on with us and in us. There is nothing about our lives that he's not aware of. And while Judas was carrying on behind the scenes and what was, you know, the way his heart was and what he was plotting and planning, Christ knew all about it, and he announced it at that supper. Okay, so in part two, we see the Lord's Supper instituted. I have to move on for the sake of time. Lord's Supper instituted. We come to the bread and the wine. The bread and the wine. What was significant about the bread and the wine? Or let me put it another way. What does the bread and the wine symbolize? Sister Rose from Luton. Sister Rose, go ahead. The, the blood represents the shred of Jesus, the shredding of, uh, shredding of his blood, and the bread represents the body. Thank you. Body. Anyone else want to add anything to that? Um, G Sister Andrea, Jesus used the terminology because he knew that the, as farmers, as poor people, they would know that your source of survival physically would be bread, and wine is what their culture would have had drank in the time. So... It was not unknown for them to have that. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? Brother Claude, you want to say something? <clears throat> Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. <clears throat> it's really, I mean, the broken body, isn't it, of Jesus? Not just the body, of the broken body. Right. <clears throat> That's what the word represents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The, the bread represents his broken, broken body. Yeah, broken yeah. feet. Yeah. Right. Now, the natural bread, the, the natural bread and the natural wine sustains the physical body. Okay. But symbolically, it was for the spiritual body, for the inner man. Amen. 
Jesus said, your fathers ate manna. In St. John chapter 6 or 8, there about, the pastor will correct me. When he spoke to them, the Bible said, in the last day of the feast, the great day of the feast, he stood up. If any man thirst, let him come unto me. He said to them that, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. He wasn't talking about the physical life. Okay? He said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. Okay? So he said, I am that living bread that came down from heaven. Yeah? And except you eat of me, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. He was talking about eternal life. The Passover supper that they sat down to eat was to commemorate their coming out of Egypt. That bread, okay, symbolized the body of Jesus that would be broken for them. But also, it wasn't only bread that they were having for the, for the, the Passover meal. They were having what? Bitter herbs. What does that say? What, did that, what does the bitter herb speak of? I'm going to come back to this bread and wine, or, the, you know, the body and the blood, but... The bitter herbs, what did it testify of? Sister Tessa? Huh? Sister Tessa, uh, would it Go be... Ahead, Sister Tessa. Would it be um, suffering? The suffering? The bitter? Amen. That's right. That's exactly right. It, it pointed to slavery, the sufferings they endured in Egypt. Now, this bread was not just prepared like any other bread. What was different about it? Sister Gwen, what was different about this bread <clears throat> compared to the other bread that Israel was used to baking and eating? What was different about it? Unmute yourself. Yeah. It had no yeast. It had no yeast in it. Yeah. yeah. Why didn't they have yeast in the bread? I think the that yeast, particular time. I think the yeast signified sin. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but going back to Egypt that night, why did the bread not have yeast in? If you put yeast in a bread, what do you have to do? You have to destroy it. Huh? You would have to destroy it because it'd be no good. <laughs> As okay. said, Sabrina, if you have yeast, you have to wait for it to rise. Thank you. Thank you. This was being done in haste. Oh, yeah. Okay? yeah. So there, there was no time to wait for yeast to rise. But it would also, because it was pointing to Christ, God is so wonderful that nothing is ever just as it is. And that's why you have to look deeply into the text sometimes. Sometimes I might sound like a crazy preacher, but I like to look, or the Spirit takes me into whatever is going on. Let me turn every rock over and let me see it from a different point of view. So because they were moving in haste that night, it had to be done in haste. So there was no time to wait for the yeast to allow the bread to rise. So it was classified as unleavened bread. Okay? But it was pointing to Christ who was sinless because yeast is a bacteria, is it not? Okay? Yes. So... The unleavened bread. And that is why when we are going to have communion or Lord's Supper, we can't just go and have any and any bread. It's got to be done right. Otherwise, it's not. We're not remembering the Lord's death until he comes. Okay? It's important for us to understand this. So the bread was a special bread because it was being made in haste. And the, the bitter herbs was, was reminding them of the suffering that they were leaving behind because it was their time of deliverance, okay? So Jesus, when he said, when he instituted his own supper, it was different from the, 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 pre, the previous supper because this was for the 12. And after washing their feet, he said, do you know what I've done to you? It's important for us to know exactly what Christ has done to us. We can't, just go through life thinking, yes, I'm saved. The scale on which we are saved, the, the purchase of our salvation, and that's why we're remembering him. Yeah? 
This wasn't Peter's idea or John's idea. Jesus said, yeah, as often as you do this, you do so in remembrance of me. If we can remember soldiers and police and firemen and the NHS and people who do great works for mankind, let alone the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for the entire world. Amen. So yes, the, the, the bread, the broken bread, as Brother Claude pointed out, there are some things that has to be broken in order to yield its fruit. Somebody mentioned, you cannot eat a coconut without breaking it. Yeah? You can't eat an egg without breaking it. Okay? And there are fruits which you have to break into it. Unless you peel back the skin, you can't partake of the fruit. Some fruits are not like an apple or a pear. You can just bite into it. Okay? So Christ had to be broken and divided, as it were, among mankind so that we might have the life of God, the spiritual life. His divinity kept him at a place of obedience that his humanity would yield or submit himself to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, let me move on because time is running away from me. Okay, so this he said, do in remembrance of me. Oh, but before I move on to that, it is about the new covenant. There was an old covenant, was there not? We talked about it before, the blood of goats and of bulls, animal blood that was shed under the old covenant. But this was a new covenant. This was a new dispensation. This was the dispensation of grace. The law was being done away with and grace was taking over. So we are now in the dispensation of grace. Man, at last, can be called sons of God. The veil in the temple was going to be rented so that you and I, as priests in ourselves, could appear before God because whatever he was, that is what he has made us. But I don't want to be too technical. I want to keep it simple, okay? So bear with me if um, I don't go too much into it, Overseer Diedrich, as you would have done and Bishop would have done and so on, okay? <clears throat> I'm just doing really an overview for the sake of time. So the New Testament is in the blood of Jesus. And that's why he said, except you eat of my flesh. Remember, the manna that came from above in the wilderness was to sustain their physical lives. And they ate that for 40 years and they died. But whosoever would eat, not the communion that is served in church, not the bread and wine that is served in church, okay? That is just a symbol, yeah, of the body and the blood of Christ. And when we partake of it, we are saying, we, we, we accept it, we believe it, we endorse it, we are part of it. Just like when Peter said, Lord, you mustn't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no lot nor part with me. And he realized and said, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Okay, this do in remembrance me. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take this, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24, he said, For I have received of the Lord that which... Okay, let me just back up a little bit because I didn't mention the part about what took place after he said that. In verse 24, he said to them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, what kind of a hymn do you think they sang? What kind of a hymn do you think they sang? 
Do you think they sang God is moving along, he's leading the way? Sister Jean. Yes, Sister Jean, go ahead. One of the Psalms. Which Psalm, Sister Jean? Maybe not specifically, but what category of Psalms? Praise Psalm. Praise, yes, but where about? Pay attention to this, everyone. From the, from the Torah. From the Torah, yes, but I'm talking in terms of Psalm 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, I'm not sure. Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. Those were the Passover Psalms. Okay? Remember that. Those Psalms were sung specifically for Passover. Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. Okay? So, Jesus and his disciples would have sung one of those Psalms. And from there, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And we know what happened. Who can just quickly fill in the gaps for me? You don't have to go all the way, but just tell me quickly what happened in, in, in the garden. Sister Kay, again, can you fill in that, that little gap for me very quickly? I have to hurry. From, from the upper room, Mm -hmm. or, or from the supper, Jesus went somewhere with his disciples. Um, he said that he left and he went to the, they went to the Mount of Olives. I think that's where we left off in chapter 14. Okay. Mark, and they'd sang. And then I think it leads us into the next portion, which talks more about um, his actual death and going into the Garden of Gethsemane and all of that part that comes after okay thank you right for the sake of time then let me go to first corinthians chapter 11 in corinthians chapter 11 23 to 26 which were the verses we read tonight for i have received of the lord that which also i delivered unto you who was speaking was it peter james john Who was speaking? Um, Sister Jean, um, Paul the, the Apostle. Paul the Apostle. Speaking to the church at Corinth. Okay? The church at Corinth was a, a large church, a very influential church. So much so that he dedicated 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians in large volumes to them, as opposed to Thessalonians or the Philippians. But there was something about these brethren. They were very unruly in various departments. And even when it comes to Lord's Supper, there was a problem. But the point is, the great point is for us to understand, because some say that um, the commun communion is not necessary today. It was something for the disciples. And there are those who take, you know, like, like a menu, they choose to have certain parts and not other parts. But the Apostle Paul said, for I have received of the Lord. In other words, Christ instituted it with the twelve. And here now Paul, who was not one of the twelve, but who came later, but having met Christ and was taught by Christ and others whom Christ had placed in his life to mentor him until he was ready for service. He said, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Every preacher who stands before you must receive something from the Lord or to, put it, to turn it around, what they deliver to the church must be received of the Lord. Okay? So when you go to services and they tell you, they're ready to tell you, oh, we won't bother with the word. Oh, we won't have any word. You know, think about that. Because what so, the word said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, by who? Who was it? By Judas. Yeah? 
the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, was it important that he gave thanks? Overseer, Overseer Diedrich. Yes. Why is that, do you think? Yes, and that, that, you know, that was a common practice that Jesus did among his disciples. They, they recognized him even through this, this, this prayer and mm -hmm. recognizing also that, you know, God is our provider. Yes. Yes, he is. Mm. Believers must always give thanks to God, no matter how small or how significant what we receive is. Always give thanks. Amen. Jesus' life was such an example. Or should I say, the Lord Jesus. We just call him Jesus. You know, we, we have our titles, you know, brother so-and-so and evangelist. We just call him Jesus. The Lord Jesus set a great example in everything that he did. When he went to Lazarus' grave, he prayed. Okay? When he brought the bread to feed the 5,000, the, 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 the small loaves and the fish, he prayed. He gave thanks. And we likewise, and even in this situation at the Passover, he gave thanks. He was in his priestly role. And he was, he was handling the bread, which anything that is placed in the hand of God or the hand of Christ doesn't remain merely what it is. It is transformed somehow, just like how the bread and fish was transformed to feed the multitude. So when we sit down to eat the Lord's Supper or to remember him, let us be partakers. Realize it is a solemn feast. It's a solemn occasion. We are remembering the Lord's death for us until he comes. The Corinthians failed to observe this. And this is what Paul went on to address. If you read further on, you'll see how he instructed them how they should conduct themselves because what they were doing, they were demeaning or cheapening the significance of Lord's Supper. So he said, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. I must point out that not all the Gospels put it that way. Only here in Mark and Paul's letters to the Corinthians. Okay? So you might not find it in Matthew and possibly in John exactly in the same way. Because emphasis were placed by certain writers on other things. But Jesus took the bread, he broke it, he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Our topic today, or this evening, is in remembrance of me. I don't care whether you remember me or you remember the overseer or the bishop as much as they, you know, require respect for their hard work over many years. But if, even if we forget their labor of love among us, let us not forget what Christ has done. Let us not forget to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. For as often as you eat this bread, how often should we have Lord's Supper? And I'm not trying to be con controversial with your church or whatever. How often do you think we should have Lord's Supper? What is the perfect answer? Uh, Sister Andrea, I think the Bible says, you just said it's as often. So it's up to you how much time, but you must have it. You should have it. 
Thank you. The, the answer, the correct answer must surely be as often as possible, isn't it? That's the only answer. You know, I know different churches have preferences once a month. Some, some faiths have it every day, you know, which we won't mention. That <laughs> is between, sorry? No, I love some faiths have it every day. Well, the Catholics have it every day, don't they? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they, do, they do. They do. They have mass every day. That's right. Sometimes twice a day. Because their church is open for people to go at any time, etc., and etc., receive communion. Okay. But I'm saying, it's not a wrong and right to say to this pastor, oh, you should this and you should that. But the Bible said, or Jesus says, as often, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. Okay? So I'm not making it difficult for any pastor. And it's not for the saints to argue with the pastor about how often they should have come. But the Lord says, as often as you do this. So it really should be as often as possible. Now, I've avoided reading any of the exposition. But coming down to the internalizing of the message. Or just before that, it says remembrance on purpose. We must deliberately do this. The Lord's Supper serves as a wonderful memory device. Memories triggered by feeling the bread's texture, tasting the wine juice, hearing the Lord's words, and sharing the time with disciples of all ages guide the church in celebrating the supper. A biblical understanding of memory fits well with the contemporary neuroscience discoveries. Okay, it talks about <clears throat> how the brain works and what triggers memories, etc. I'm not really going to go into that. You can read that yourself. But extended family meals fill the table with people who care for each other and have, shared, have a shared story, which such meals can be as simple as a pizza or as elaborate as a meal prepared by a trained chef. Memories make the meal a celebration. When disciples gather around the Lord's table, they hear of the torn body, the broken body, the poured blood. But the meal must be a celebration rather than a wake. Remembering the Lord makes the difference. He paid the price for everlasting joy. He opened the door for faithfully living in the spirit. Disciples having the choice of dipping in the bitter bowl or sharing the bread and cup, all shame and sorrow disappear when we share Jesus' offering rather than betraying his mission. Remembering the wonder of the meal creates new possibilities as brothers and sisters take fresh steps to be salt and light in a hurting world. Feasting at the table provides the sustaining nourishment to do so. We leave the table in power of the Spirit. Now, in light of all that, in light of all we have talked about, there are some people who are never able to take Lord's Supper or communion. Do you think that's okay? If anybody thinks that's okay. Sorry, why can't they take it? It's not a matter of, that's a question for them. I'm saying that there are those who chose constantly not to take the Lord's Supper. Can I say something that might be controversial, but as far as I understand, it's true nevertheless. If I don't judge myself worthy to take Lord's Supper, then surely if the rapture comes, I am not ready. Yeah? Mm. That is, okay, I'm not saying that's the litmus test in itself, but it's, it's an indicator of where we are. Elder Carl. Yes, Elder Carl, go ahead. That's uh, very interesting. Um, just um, two things and then um, this bit. 
the, 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 the memory, the often as we do this, is to mm -hmm. keep alive, not only among the saints, but also in the generations. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't do it and the next generation perpetuate it, Very then it would then cease to exist. And yes. the next generation would not have a clue or a testimony as yeah. to why, you know, about this, the salvation that we've received. Thank you. So Thank it is you. so important that it is um, appropriated pre by the, the generations. And so mm -hmm. in our generation, we show that example and we pray, God, that the next generation will also take it further for the next generation. So that's important. Mm -hmm. And then we come to what he was, he was the question you were saying that... Um, why we are fearful. Mm -hmm. It could come down to the fact that we have not been living too well. Right. <laughs> because that can cause fear. Yes. But if we remember, if we have confessed and remember what Jesus said, that if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. he is faithful and just to forgive us. Amen. But that's if we are not presumptuously sinning yeah. and then coming to take lots of So Some people can be afraid of that but they need to be honest with themselves, whether they've been presumptuous or, yep. but if, you know, it's not a presumptuous sin, then basically we have uh, 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 what you call uh, uh, a remedy that if we confess uh, and yes. then he'll forgive us of our sins. Amen. Thank you very much for that, Elaka. Very, very, very good points. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for that. What I was really saying, I wasn't, you know, having a go at anyone, I was merely highlighting the fact that over my 50 years of being in church or 50 odd years of being in church, I've always seen um, certain people who are never in a position to take Lord's Supper. And it might make them look as if, well, they're being honest because they've examined themselves. But if, if that individual didn't have Lord's, Lord's Supper last time because they didn't feel worthy, and they didn't have it the next time. And they didn't have it the next time. Yeah? Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do show forth my death until I come. So really, we do it in remembrance of him. And if Paul says, let a man examine himself. Okay? Because he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, yeah, will, as I paraphrase, will take unto themselves damnation. So it is a solemn feast, and we have to, as Ella Carl says, not take it presumptuously, knowing that we are not at the place to receive it, but we must make sure that we are at the place to be partakers of the Lord's Supper, because we do so in remembrance of him. Okay. Yeah. It is half past Pardon? Could, I, could I just say something? Yes, go ahead. You'll have another 10, 15 minutes, by the way. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't yeah. rush too much. Um, just wanted to say with your point regarding those who consistently mm -hmm. um, don't take Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. um, this lesson is entitled In Remembrance of Me. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it would therefore suggest that they are not remembering Christ because Lord Lord's Supper shouldn't be the only time we remember. That's right. And so, therefore, we should be living a lifestyle mm -hmm. of memory, a lifestyle of remembering Christ. Amen. So if our lifestyle is to remember Christ, the same way our lifestyle of worship and praise, etc., then it shouldn't be a case where we consistently can't partake in Lord's Supper. Right. And so this lesson drives home the point that this was just a physical um, thing, a symbol, yes. something, something symbolic mm -hmm. to make it come to the forefront of their minds. Yes. But after the Lord's Supper is done, the memory shouldn't leave. Yes. We should still have the awareness of Christ every day of our life. Amen. Um, if, only, if the only time we really are examining ourselves is when it comes around to Lord's Supper, then I think we're missing the point of Lord's Amen. Supper. 
If the only time we're really um, having Christ in our consciousness and in the forefront of our mind, then we are actually missing the point Mm -hmm. of Lord's Supper. And so I would say that in remembrance of me is it extends to every day of our life mm. living with the consciousness of Christ therefore we will not have to feel condemned or I'm not worthy and as it has been said we pray we examine ourselves we say God I'm found I'm found lacking I'm found wanting we ask for his forgiveness but we cannot be in this consistent place of not being able to partake Amen. Thank you very much, Minister Kay. Right at this point, are there any are there any questions? Yeah, yeah, Obviously, it's here. If I can't answer your questions, any questions you'd like to ask? And Elder Carl's there in the background, and others who might be listening in. Yes. Any questions at this time? Brother Billy. Brother yes, Gar- sir. Brother Garfield. Yes, Brother Garfield. Um, when the Bible said, "I won't have this Lord's Supper. I drink of this wine. Drink of this wine." Yeah. Until I have it new with you yeah. <clears throat> in my kingdom. Mm-hmm. What's that mean? And what's that mean? I... Right. I'll pass that question over to Overseer Deidre. I believe, or Elder Carl, I believe the Lord was talking about, you know, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I will agree. I will okay. agree with you. Uh, because yeah. Jesus would not be physically present with mm-hmm. them. On, and, and I would say until the second coming, yes, cer- certainly when the church is, is raptured. And yes, so I'd say he was alluding to the marriage supper of the land. That's how I understand it. That's right. Thank you. Um, yes. The, the, the next point, I, I believe when we have Lord's Supper, the Lord is sitting there with us mm-hmm. because we are spirit in the church. Next, right. next thing I would want to know, because the disciple didn't know that when they're doing Passover, is under mm-hmm. the lamb. They didn't know. So they were doing it. Um, sorry, say that, sorry, say that again. The disciples did not know. The disciples know. didn't know the lamb was Christ. Right. So they asked for the Passover and they were mm-hmm. doing it unto the Old Testament. Right. The law. Yeah. So when Jesus, that's why he introduced the, the, the Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. So when Jesus introduced the, 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 the Lord's Supper, yeah. I think they didn't know that he was the lamb. So he said, as often right. as you take it, it don't mean you take it Wednesday, Thursday, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day. He mean mm-hmm. as often as you take it, make sure it represent me. Yeah. You think it of me, you don't do it unto the Old Testament. That's right. That's what I, I, I believe. Yeah, that, that is true. The Old Testament was being closed out, yeah? And the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is in the blood yeah. of Jesus, okay, was about to begin. Okay? Brother Bill? Yes, Brother sir. Paul? Brother Paul? Yes, Brother go ahead. Paul from Luke. Yes, Brother Paul, go ahead. It was a, it's not a question. I just wanted to make a comment just before you said... Oh, can we, uh, if you've got any questions, but it was really okay. about where you was talking about those that feel they're not worthy of yeah. being able to take the communion. Because I, yeah. I think, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, in, in, during, during your, your, your talk about the, the, the blood of the lamb in the mm-hmm. Old Testament, which was offered again and again. Yeah. And I think just as obviously, obviously as Jesus has only been offered once. And I mm-hmm. think when, when a believer comes to the Lord's table, it's also a place to remember where he put everything right for us. Right. And that's why he doesn't have to be offered and again and again. So I think, you know, Paul does say, let a man examine himself, but he also mm-hmm. says to see whether he be in the faith. That's right. And if you constantly think that you're out of sorts with God, then sometimes we need to adjust our thinking and say, look, this is when he put these things right. Right. So I, I always come to the Lord's table remembering that that we're not sacrificing him again. We're remembering yeah. what he done to put, yes. put ourselves right with God. Ab- absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that, um, Brother Paul. Did you finish what you were saying? Going to say, Pastor Deidre? Were you going to say um, something else? Yes. Now, you know, the, the, the new covenant 
Uh, or should I say that the remembrance here, mm -hmm. okay, the reminder of, you know, what Christ did for us mm -hmm. is about our salvation. Right. Okay. And, you know, after the, and the deliverance out of Egypt, each year they were to celebrate this, this freedom, this delivery. We're, we're no longer slaves. We're, That's right. you know, we're, you know, we're safe. So uh, the, the remembrance is, is, is each time we take the Lord's Supper, it, it's a celebration of our deliverance, mm -hmm. you know, our salvation, what Christ did for us at Calvary, That's you know, right. and, and we're looking for him to come. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for that. How much time have we got, Sister Kay? Let's just look again at the, the golden text, as it were, the, the focus verse. And as they did eat, this is verse 24. Sorry. And... Sorry, verse 22. Yeah. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. The last thing I will say before I hand back to Minister K, is that Jesus was a new type of man. Adam was the, the old man. Okay? I often use the analogy of the car, and I'll just tell you this very quickly. I've said it many times before in my own church. When, when Ford designed a car, as Elder Carl will know, that car don't just quickly come off the production line and go straight into the showroom to be sold to you and I. The first design, the first prototype has got to be tested and it goes through many rigorous tech checks to make sure that everything is okay. When they are finally happy that it is right and ready and fit for road, for, you know, for road use by by, by, the, by the public. And even then, sometimes they have problems which, you know, they have to do a recall. But from once they perfected that, everything else is run off from that model. Okay? Adam was the first prototype of man. And all of us are run off that production line by virtue of man and woman coming together to have a child. We grow up so Whatever Adam and Eve were, that's exactly what we are physically. Now, Jesus came into the world as a new type of man. Yeah? He's not a man of flesh and blood. He is the spirit man. The first man was of the earth, and the second man was from heaven. So in order that we might be partakers of him and become like him, okay? We have got to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. We have got to accept him, okay, for all that God has presented him to be for us. So we are shedding the old, we have the old Adamic nature and we are putting on Christ. And ultimately, what will be finished, Bill Linton from, you know, my parents <coughs> will cease to be. And the new creation which was taking place inside all along from the production line of Jesus Christ will be what we are when we meet him in glory. So whatever he tells us, when he says, do this in remembrance of me, it is worthwhile taking note because of the magnitude of what he did for us. May we all learn to appreciate it. And next time Lord's Supper is announced in our churches, let us all say, not Lord, you know, like how they said around the table, Lord, is it I? But say, Lord, I want to be. And whatever might be in our lives, that's not right. Let us talk it over with God. As Elder Carl says, the word says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful. Okay? to forgive us of all our sins. And therefore, let us make ourselves right that when we draw to the table, 
we can be one of them who is worthy to be partakers of his blood and of his body. We will be part of, after all, we are part of the new covenant. Therefore, let us make sure that it is a hallmark of our lives. God bless you. I'm going to hand back to yeah. Minister K. Yeah, Dawkins, quick, just, um, before you go, Minister K, I just wanted to, I have deliberately kept quiet. I didn't want to spoil the lesson. You've done an excellent really job. Good. Excellent job. Let me just, um, just mention two very quick things. <coughs> um, because we, 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 do have a, we do have a legacy that has been passed down to us from the old fathers who preached and taught communion. And um, a lot of the, 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 the harsh way in which they spoke of the, of the preparation and the guilt and the unworthiness, that has precipitated a lot of problems for us even today. There, there are people that have passed it for 25 years and they've never taken communion, not even once. So it is a, it is a serious problem. That, that exists in our churches. And, and I think it's good that a lesson like this should not just be to the converted, but it should reach out. Um, in verses 27 and 29 of 1 Corinthians 11, you find the word unworthily coming up a couple of times. That's eating and drinking <coughs> unworthily. And yeah. This was primarily for the Corinthians who did so uh, in, in, the, in the reckless way in which they did it. And Paul wanted to correct their practice because... It was not within the spirit of keeping with what the Lord had instituted, and therefore um, he, he addressed that. So there's, there's, a, there's a paradox here in a way, because on the one hand, he doesn't want to say to them, everyone should have carte blanche to take communion regardless of the condition you're in, mm. which is what some people advocate. Mm. But on the other hand, he's saying we should not feel so absolutely guilty all the time that we never feel as though we are worthy. Because we are, we are worthy by virtue of the shed blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we could not actually be worthy by our own means. And as, as it has been said several times, it's really understanding what Christ has done for us and giving us that forgiveness and that freedom. The, the, the other word that comes up is the word discerning, discerning the Lord's body. And that's an important word also in verse 28 because the, the taker of the Lord's Supper should... In, in eating and drinking should have a discernment of exactly what he or she is doing. And again, we don't just draw to the table recklessly, but we recognize exactly what it is that we're doing, that it's a privilege. And it's a, and that, you know, it, it is not just, it's not just really a ritual that we remember. It does have a, a very deep, significant meaning. And I would just close this out by saying that uh, we, we, we do, have to conduct this self-examination. This self-assessment is more important than anybody else's assessment of us. Because at the end of the day, each of us has got a conscience uh, and we face God one-to-one -one when, we, when we come before God, when that communion service comes about. So I think that we should discern the Lord's body. We should examine ourselves. We certainly don't want to fall into the category of them that are sickly. We don't want to follow the category of them that sleep. But the old pastors used to make the saints feel as though if you draw to the table and there's anything wrong, you're going to, be, you're going to die, you're going to go to hell and all that kind of stuff. But it's the way in which it was preached and taught in those early days why a lot of that um, 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 legacy that surrounds the communion. But the, the beauty of, of, of what we are talking about tonight is that, yes, we, we, we are not doing it recklessly, but we are discerning the Lord's body. We're not are taking on worthily what we are showing forth is there. Bishop Anderson always used to stress to us two things. It is looking back to what Christ has done, but it's also looking forward for his coming. It's, it's, about, it's about what he has done, but it's also what he has promised that he will do. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Okay. <clears throat> Minister Kay, back to you. God bless you, Elder Bill. Thank you. God bless you so much for a well-taught wonderful lesson i pray that we have all been edified and strengthened and most of all that god will be glorified amen, amen. Uh, thank you all for your participation i pray we've all taken some notes and have got food for thought things to mull over in our spirit and to draw closer to god so thanks again elder bill much appreciated god bless you bless you um, at this time, I'm going to hand over to Minister Paul Williams for final announcements for the week ahead. God bless you. 
God bless you all. Uh, thank you again, Minister Dawkins, and thanks to Elder Bill Linton for leading us in that very powerful um, topic this evening. There were a couple of questions that had come in. Uh, just wanted to check with Elder Bill Linton if you wanted to just respond to one which said, considering what Elder Linton, not sure which elder, considering what Elder Linton has just said, was Judas and Peter qualified to sit at the table? Just wanted just to just to sort that out just in the last minute or two before I do the final announcements. Elder Bill. They were. Um, remember, <clears throat> the Holy Ghost hadn't been yet given, but Christ was with them. There were many things that the disciples were exempt from because they were still in the learning process. Okay. And remember that Jesus has the ability to forgive men of their sins. He, had, he ran into the, the scribes and Pharisees always. When, for instance, when he healed a man, I think he had, he had a hand problem or something like that, or the man who was lame, and he said, your sins be forgiven you. Yeah, And they took, they took issue with him on that. So while the bridegroom was with, with them, as it were, they, you know, he control the situation. So we could split hairs about afterwards. If Peter, after the Holy Ghost was given, yeah, if Peter had behaved in that way, he would have to go and confess, yeah, before he could draw to the table. Or let me put it another way so you understand. If Peter and Judas was in the present day church, yeah, then they both would have to repent to receive the Lord's Supper. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. It does. yeah, but at that time, because Christ was in complete control of the supper that he was instituting, he alone could judge Amen. whether they were worthy or not. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we've got an amen there to okay. confirm that. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you. Said for, for listening and partaking. Uh, what will happen is the with the, with the permission of the teacher, this recording will be made available in the next few days or so on YouTube. So please look out for that. Please subscribe to Buell Apostolic online on YouTube in order to make sure that when it does become public, you'll be the first to see it. Uh, next week, we will have yet another uh, teacher and that teacher will be covering the topic of watch and pray. Watch and pray. And as you can see on the screen, this focus verse is Matthew 26, verse 41. Amen. Just, just in summary also, just um, if we were in our normal church buildings, I'm sure we would have raised an offering of sorts. Um, for those members of Beulah Apostolic Church who are involved with their local WhatsApp groups, they'll have the details available to give. For those who are visiting or those who are not part of Beulah and wish to give, we have a PayPal account which you're free to, um, to give to. Just look up uh, BAC UK and you will find it there.